Welcome to the Highland Report, Kadi Yakasan. You are a famous uh, lifestyle coach and uh, here in Norway, mm -hmm. and a TV personality, quite a TV star in this country. And so many love you for all the work you've done over the years. And recently, you've done something quite spectacular. You have gone to Syria and gotten engaged in much of the protests that now go on in the Scandinavian countries uh, against what we perceive to be misleading information uh, on our part on, on, from our leading media. Mm. And there's a growing protest among the people stating that we do not want our political elites to keep telling us these stories that we hear about Syria, that so many p believe now to be misinformed. Are we misinformed? What's going on? We are absolutely, we have been misinformed. Uh, we've heard uh, a very limited uh, perspective about what's going on in Syria, completely in favor of the so-called rebels. I refuse to use the word rebels, I use the word terrorists because all their actions are terrorist actions. And uh, the sources that the media have been using have been very compromised. They have not informed us about the, this uh, biased and compromised uh, use of sources. For example, uh, one source that still, they still use and that they claim to be an exile group, a Syrian exile group, is the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which long ago has been exposed as a one-man show. Uh, a Syrian who has not been in Syria for maybe 15 years, uh, totally opposed to the Assad government, uh, he's sitting in his flat in Coventry, spewing out information. Nobody knows his sources. They are anonymous. It's uh, impossible to verify. And still all the big outlets quote him. This is completely unacceptable and certainly not in a journalistic profession uh, the way it should, uh, is supposed to be. You should always be able to verify your information or at least make the reader aware that this is where the information is coming from, this, so we can understand that it's a compromised source. There seems to be such a geopolitical struggle in the Middle East, of course, uh, what one would say mainly between the Saudi Arabia and, and the Iran, let's put it that way. Mm. But um, so many in the West now, among the people, and this is important for our viewers in the Middle East to understand that so many in the West are deeply, deeply yes. distraught and, and, and against, on so many levels, what is going on among the political elites. For example, in the United States, 74% of the American people stated they do not want any more wars in the Middle East. Uh, that was particular for Iraq. But still we see how uh, the political elites in, in the United States and in, in, in Europe as well still engage in these invasion in country after country. Mm. Uh, it, it seems to me that somebody hijacked our democracy. Absolutely. And in my opinion, the, the people in many countries, for example in the United States, are actually held hostage. They're held hostage because their own country is crumbling. There's a growing poverty in the United States. There's a huge uh, opioid epidemic. There are a lot of things that doesn't function at all. And still they use more than half of their uh, BNP on war to make rich people richer while the population is struggling just to pay their basic bills. The problem is that we don't know how to act upon this indignation and this frustration. There is something, there is a tool missing in our toolbox. Uh, so most people, they just vent their frustration, but they don't know how to act to change the system. And actually, in the United States, I follow a lot of blogs, there are people talking about a, a violent revolution. I don't know. I don't know how to turn, to turn the, our leaders into leaders and not egoistic, greedy elites. That's how many people perceive our leaders now. It's a problem, of course, that the United States now, I think, have approximately $20 trillion in debt. I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's a very complicated situation. And looking at the, let's say, marriage between the Saudi Arabia and the United States as well, uh, many, 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 Marin Katusa being one of them, have uh, spoken very frankly about the problem of uh, Saudi Arabia 
which is obliged to buy the American bonds and sell their oil in the dollar and the United States knowing that if more countries start to do what uh, Muammar Gaddafi attempted to, namely implement the gold standard in, oh, and start to down. use yes. the yen, uh, you know, this c could very easily be the downfall of the dollar and if we so have uh, if this were to happen, one could see the United States go from a first world to a third world country within within basically weeks. So the yeah. leading economists in the world are, of course, talking about this as a, an imminent collapse or something that could happen. Now, let's hope that this will not happen. But nonetheless, you see that Saudi Arabia has, due to his marriage with the United States, been able to completely dominate Western media. Yes, Whatever absolutely. the Saudis love is what we're told to <laughs> love in our media. Yes. So, so this is a paradox. We are to dislike the secular moderate Muslims. Yes. Such as Muammar Gaddafi and such as now Bashar al-Assad. Yes. yes, we are to dislike those and we are to, you know, and love... And people take the bait. That's the problem. People take the bait. There, 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 there was a blog recently, Caitlin Johnson, that I follow, a, a wonderful blog, and she had the heading, you only hate Assad because your TV told you to. That's the problem. People are, you know, in all media, especially television, there is a certain rhythm. We're very used to hearing American voices. In Norway, if you switch through the channels on the television, there's only there are more English spoken programs than Norwegian spoken programs. English or British, mostly, uh, sorry, British or American. So we are used to hearing those voices. We're used to hearing that way of speaking. We're used to seeing the branding uh, edition, the branded edition of the United States. So that when we hear news from America, people are used to this, they absorb it very easily. And our media, they just repeat exactly what is in all the other Western uh, media and people are being programmed. So when they hear another story, they, they experience a deep discomfort and they become very aggressive towards people like me, for example, who come and say, well, you know, I've been to Syria, I've seen another side of the story. Would you like to listen? And people want to listen, but the media are quite aggressive, actually. And the thing is, which is so paradoxical, Saudi Arabia doesn't really create anything. They have money, but at the same time, a quarter of their population is living be beneath the poverty line. There are uprisings in Saudi Arabia that are being dealt with in a very violent way. We never hear about it here. They're very protected in our media. Now, how, why is that? There have been a lot of uproars in the United States. We saw one in the Dakota pi Pipeline case, but there are many others. We never hear about them here. So the media is suppressing certain stories and highlighting and exaggerating other stories, all in order to persuade us to see the world in a certain manner. There's a number of, of voices now, of course, Neil Ferguson um, and, 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 and very many uh, actually speak about this, that we are at the end of the Roman Empire, let's well, say. Well, I mean, in the beginning of the Roman Empire, wherever the Romans went and conquered land, they also created roads, they started building things, it was possible to, you know, I mean, it was a positive spin to things. Mm. There was a reason why everybody wanted to live within the borders of the Roman uh, Empire, because they were protected there, outside there was barbarism and, and, you know, lawlessness, but there was an order, there were the citizens, a Roman citizen had his rights yeah. uh, to a number of, of, of things which, which created stability within that uh, element. But then as time passed and as decadence came and, you know, I mean, the Romans were not able to, to, to provide stability anymore. And then it ended up being brute force. Uh, and many speak in this manner of the West today and fear the backlashes that may come from those countries that are subdued and that are bombed. And I've been particularly engaged in the Libya war yeah. case. Uh, it's it's unbelievable to see the way Western uh, Western leaders avoid being taken to the ICC yes. and 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 in the Hague and and judged. I mean, we should have seen sentences thirty, forty years in prison for for allowing uh, such a prosperous state as as Libya uh, to 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 go into complete uh, 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 trashes there. And uh, although obviously Gaddafi was not a perfect man, these Who were regimes. Yes. So. so so you cannot cause such 
uh, injustice no. and expect that there will not be a backlash against you for doing so. This is what many now fear for, for the West and for Europe. Well, um, you know, one thing is what the... I, I, my home country, Norway, is deeply guilty in what happened to Libya. And there has been almost no discourse about it in Norway because all the politicians agreed. Nobody knows how they agreed. There is not one public document that shows us how did they come to the conclusion of bombing Libya. But Jens Stoltenberg, who uh, was a prime minister at that time, and this was just after we had a horrible terror incident here in Norway, the worst in our history. It was just not long after that. He was going to a meeting, I think it was in Paris, and he needed to have something to put on the table. He wanted a job as a NATO secretary uh, general of NATO. And I think that was his, uh, that was his uh, way in. There is no other reason for Norway to bomb Libya. Libya had never threatened Norway, had never attacked Norway. And it all happened so fast. Not that long before, the United States have, had granted money for Libya for certain projects. So this was a completely turn of the of events. And Libya had opened up. I mean, when you look back at 2007, yes, it was a huge 2008. tourist destination even. Absolutely. I mean, it's... It's, it's such an indecent thing that happened that the words cannot even describe it. And after, silence. We have had no Norwegian newspapers really probing in to see what has happened to Libya. We get some glimpse here and there from international media, but it's, it's complete silence. And the, they, the, the politicians resisted having an inquiry. This is why I understand a number of the African leaders and presidents who say to you that it's better not to have the ICC because they only yeah, send Africans yes, there absolutely. and Serbians, let's yes. say, those are the only people that ever go there. Yeah. And then you have the charade of year, year, year in and year out of, of you know, the trial going on. And, and so, so there's an element of injustice here. And, 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 and this is deeply, deeply problematic also watching how the IMF and World Bank and, yes. you know, control things and, and nations such as both Libya and, and Iraq at the time and, and also Syria having no loans. So, so that there's, there's economic things here going on in the name of globalism that, Absolutely. that is deeply unjust, I find. I think globalism is such a, it's a, it's a the, that word is it's too nice. It's just, there's just one word for this, and this mafia, this is mafia. This is a crooked criminal activity going on. And it's certainly not something that's profitable or, or doing anything for the prosperity and the health and the well-being and happiness of people. That's not their goal, that's not their objective at all. And we mustn't lose faith in that we live on a beautiful planet with abundance. We could all live in abundance, all of us. We could all have clean water, we could all have access to a toilet, which is a huge problem for many people. Everybody could go to school. We could all eat well, be well, be happy. This is not an impossible dream, this is not utopia, this is completely possible. But unfortunately, we have leaders who are doing Crazy wars. For what? Nobody's profiting except a very small minority. So this, we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that it's naive or silly or, you know, uh, utopian to imagine that we could have a planet where we cooperate, we prosper, everybody's happy, everybody's fine, everybody can have access to health services. This is completely accessible and possible even within our lifespan, if they could just stop using all the money for military and wars, because all the wars are unwarranted, they are dead. There's no justification for any of them. And to see a country like Saudi Arabia, let's say, who managed such vast wealth, imagine, imagine what they could have done with that money. Imagine if they had spent just a tiny bit of that money to help people have a better life. Really, to really be religious as they claim to be, and use this money for the good of people. There is no justification for war, ever. Yeah, there is justification for the Syrian Arab army these days to defend themselves. But when you look, listen to a NATO meeting and they start talking about defense budgets, those are not defense budgets, those are attack budgets. So we have to stop letting them have their newspeak and correct them because there is nothing about NATO, let's say, which is about peace. It's all about war. And we must accept that as something 
unavoidable or, or natural because it's not. It's quite a paradox and we've spoken about it before, the fact that uh, according to Oxfam 62, I think it was, uh, individuals in the world now own half of almost half of world assets. Yeah. We also see in the United States over 90% of the media is owned by six corporations and those are also all into each other's <coughs> boards. So this seems to be the end result of, of the so-called globalization has been the free flow of capital, yeah. borderless uh, between, and, 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 and that has caused and ended up actually assembling immense amounts of wealth into the hands of the very few. And it's questionable um, how, how much they do think about the well-being of this planet. They don't. And, and how we're all created by God to live side by side exactly. and to, you know, respect each other, also respect each other's differences yeah. and respect national sovereignty. Yes. So, so, so this is both the national sovereignty of nations such as Norway, the right of Norway and Scandinavian countries to decide within its own borders Absolutely. what to, what to, uh, how to live. But that also implies the right of nations such as Libya and Syria to own their own wealth and to administer the wealth and decide what type of structure or governmental system they would would like to have within their structures. But there seems to be some kind of angst in certain people in the top leadership of the world, of the world because we've seen the same thing in so many countries, African countries, Latin American countries, who, where the people elect leaders who are about distribution, a more just distribution of wealth, they get crushed right away. Why are they so afraid? What, what's wrong with these people that have the need to to, to grab all this power, grab all this wealth, they will die anyway. We, will, we are all going to die. We have a certain lifespan, some are lucky, they live until they are 110, <clears throat> but then it's over. So what's wrong with them? That's something that I, I ask myself many times because they are humans, they have a heart, liver, kidneys, brain. So what went wrong? Well, how can you sit in a boardroom and decide, yeah, let's bomb this country, let's, let's fuel these crazy youths with crazy ideas and drugs and everything to make them kill, make them slit the throat of the people they used to go to church with or, or used to go to the mosque with. This is so insane. And we have to rem remind ourselves of how insane it is. And I, I don't understand how can somebody use their life for that. They have so much power to do good. They can do good and they don't. And that's unhealthy. There is something, there is something wrong. I, I, and I think that most people will not be able to understand it because they are healthy individuals. And then it's incomprehensible. There is something evil about it, actually. And I am so honored also, Kari Akasan, for, for, for you talking to us about these issues and also using your voice. And I would like to say that you now uh, enter the line of a number of um, women uh, in the West who have voiced for this. I'm thinking about Cynthia Nixon yes. in the, the Libya war, who also went there and spoke so openly <clears throat> about the processes and what went on. I'm talking about Lizzie Phelan, the, the journalist who was stuck there and who has cried and explained in the aftermath of that to Oxford uh, and m m many places she has spoken about what happened in the Libya war. I'm talking about Vanessa Bealy, oh, who yes, we know, wonderful. who also, and, and not the least also the Canadian journalist Eva, Eva Bartlett, uh, Bartlett, yes. Eva Bartlett because, um, and, and, and to us as Norwegian, it's, it was such a funny moment because uh, she was in, um, in a conference there, in a press conference, and a Norwegian journalist from one of the newspapers, uh, I think his name was Christopher Rønnebæk from from the leading one of the leading Norwegian newspapers, often Posten. Mm. And um, the, I must say, remarkably knowledge um, less. The remarkably, yeah, I would say, ignorant yeah. yes. questions he he put yeah. to her. <clears throat> Um, in that conference uh, may work as an illustration as to how little many Western journalists know 
uh, first he asked her a question saying, well, do you have any way of documenting that anybody in Syria, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I mean, there had just been elections yes. in Syria and 88 percent, I think it was stated more than before, because, of course, there's been corruption and many elements in Syria that brought the support from Assad down for uh, previously. But now people saw maybe that will be left in a horrible situation if he will not protect the Christians there, let's say. So that was one of his questions. And then uh, he had, an, I mean, the, the, the degree of ignorance, his second question was, well, why do you think that, uh, you know, I mean, we have all the international organizations on the ground reporting from there. So the journalists didn't even know that there are no international organizations, but they're talking about the white helmets or groups affiliated with the Saudi supported and Qatari supported and Western supported yes. uh, uh, rebels who are in that country creating that type of environment. So, so well, you know, the I, this is a paradox and I, I, I haven't really made up my mind uh, and I, I certainly need to speak to journalists, which I intend to do because it must be extremely frustrating to be a real journalist in a newspaper, let's say, mm -hmm. and having to write these stories. But you also have to look at the so-called humanitarian, or, or humanitarian organizations. For example, uh, Doctors Without Borders, they were talking about a bombed hospital. Uh, and then there were some questions about it because when people saw the photos, it, it had actually been damaged, but no more than it was a year before. So they compared the photos of this hospital with one year apart and they said, well, yeah, it was bombed, but again? And they had to be, there was some pull and, and push, and they had to admit, well, they haven't, hadn't actually seen it with their own eyes, but they had information from the people on the ground. And of course, in East, this was in East Aleppo. And in East Aleppo, the only information that came out was totally compromised because it was al-Nusra, that controlled, which is a terrorist group, that controlled everything. And all the people coming out of East Aleppo when the city was freed said the same story. Al-Nusra controlled everything. And when they were asked... What about the white helmets? They were well, working under the Al-Nusra. Well, Vanessa Billy has done excellent work, excellent, and is ongoing work, still working on this. And I was so lucky to travel with her in Syria. She was part of the group that I was traveling with. And I must say, she has done... Her work is amazing. And she interviewed... She was there when Aleppo was freed, and she interviewed a number of people, and she asked them specifically about health services in general, and also white helmets in particular. Not one single person said, oh, yes, thank God for white helmets, you know, they saved me. On the contrary, they said that they were only there when the cameras were rolling. When the cameras were finished rolling, they left people under the rubbles. They didn't provide any health service to anybody. And it's quite obvious. They have no telephone number. They have no address. So let's say a person is in, uh, in, a, in need of health services. How are they going to find these so-called civil defense? It's a total hoax. It's a total propaganda tool. But unfortunately, the West have adopted them. They even had an Oscar, which they deserve because they are actors, but you know, in, in that respect, but it's completely fake. And it's so amazing that trained journalists at least look at all the, the, the evidence that at least have some doubt about the, the, this group. They, they just dismiss it and they have just decided and it's we such a strange thing because you see the 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 white hell so-called white helmets only operate in rebel hell oh, area yeah, only operate in al qaeda affiliated uh, 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 you know rebel held uh, uh, areas and there's been so many photographs now where you see white helmets together with Without uh, rebel yeah. yes so so i mean how can you still go for it it's like <coughs> still trusting the syrian observatory of human rights after you know it's just one man sitting in one house in coventry yeah. and still you trust it but the deeper issues here is then you understand there's a greater force at at, at work yeah, but and, and that's the what's problematic and that's what's also worrying many of us because we're fearing that if this regional conflict does not come to an end, we might be facing a, a military struggle uh, yeah. that, that will engage us in another world war. And we would like to avoid that and rather have uh, a, a justice between peoples rather than seeing that coming again. Yeah, but you know, these, uh, the one other thing which is very important is the whitewashing because they claim that, for example, white helmets have 3,000 members. How do we know that? 
Has anybody seen the registry? I've never seen anything like that. And they have hundreds of millions of dollars in budget. What are they using the money for? This is just whitewashing. There were tons of weapons in East Aleppo. How did they come in? You know, all these humanitarian organizations have, willingly or unwillingly, helped these terrorist groups with money well, to, they also to found, buy weapons. They also found in East Aleppo a bunker uh, in which there were both Americans and uh, Israeli yeah. and, and uh, you know, I mean, military people. Yeah. So it's obviously that we are helping in one way or, or the other and, yeah. uh, and um, disregarding uh, pro or, or con Assad. I think it's just vital to let it be shown or mm. let it be stated that it's the Syrian people who should decide the fate of Syria, yeah. just as the Europeans will decide the fate of Europe. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, thank you for Kari Akeson, yes. famous uh, TV star and messenger from Norway. Of peace. Messenger of peace. Yes, thank you very much for taking your time and thank I you. I have a little gift for you, by the way. Oh. Yes, this is from Syria, oh. from probably one of the oldest churches in the world, from Malula. Really? Yes, from their little souvenir shop. And uh, I bought this and some other things. And I know that uh, this might uh, yeah, be a little uh, symbol on your desk for, uh, to have your hope for the future for all humanity. Thank you very much. And on that note, we bless all the Muslims and we bless all the Christians. All the people And we in the bless world. all the people in the Middle East and yes. we pray for peace and justice yes, absolutely. in the Middle East.